Sammy! Yeah, that mustache was never gonna stay on. You know what? If you consider yourself a fan of comics, and you don't read at least some French comic books, you might not actually be a comic book fan. Because they're the third largest publishers of comic books in the world. There's the US, there's Japan, and then there's France. And their comics have been tremendously influential, not just across European comics, but also across Western comic books, and a lot of our films. Today, I wanted to take a look at a comic that started nearly 50 years ago. Very old, very well respected, but in order to even get into that, I need to provide a bit of context about the history of French comic books, and about this book in particular that's about to be adapted into a big live-action blockbuster movie, Valerian and Laureline. The comic book Valerian and Laureline began in 1967 as a collaboration between childhood friends Pierre Christine, the writer, and Jean-Claude Mézières, the artist. The science fiction comic was published as strips in the anthology comics magazine Pilot, and each story was then collected into a volume, usually about 45 pages, fairly standard for French comics. From 1967 to 2010, the duo created 24 stories, although the first and last have yet to be collected into a volume. The stories follow Valerian and Laureline, who initially go on missions throughout time and space in their astro ship, the XB-982, for Galaxity, the capital of humanity in the 28th century. Valerian is a square-jawed traditional hero who tends to leap into action quickly and is extremely loyal to his government. His partner, Laureline, is a peasant girl from 11th century France who encounters Valerian in his first story and assists him. He takes her back to the 28th century, where she is trained as a spatio-temporal agent and assigned as his partner. They are also romantically involved. Laureline is easily Valerian's equal on missions, but she tends to be the smarter of the two. That name, Laureline, that was created by Kristen and Mezières for the comic book, and it's since become an actual popular name in France, but it was created for the comic. In the twelfth volume of the comic, The Wrath of Hypsis, Galaxity is wiped out of the time stream, and Valerian and Laureline begin working as mercenaries. The time-traveling concept always struck me as a bit similar to Doctor Who, which only came out four years before Valerian and Laureline. I've never read any statements from either Doctor Who or Valerian's creators that the TV show was an influence. Valerian and Laureline were among the most popular French strips used to support the new sci-fi anthology magazine Metal Herlant, which debuted in 1975. In 1981, an American version debuted, renamed Heavy Metal. In a time long before the internet, it was the first place many readers were exposed to European comic books, myself included. The sixth volume of Valerian and Laureline, Ambassador of the Shadows, was translated and serialized in heavy metal starting in 1981. Valerian and Laureline has proven to be tremendously influential on other artists, including American artists Gil Kane and Walt Simonson, other French comics, and perhaps most obviously, Star Wars. No one from Lucasfilm has ever acknowledged the influence of the comics, but they existed for over a decade before the Star Wars movies started and several of concept artist Joe Johnston's pieces are inspired by French comics at the time, including the work of Moebius. Here are just a few examples. The circular Millennium Falcon and its rear thrusters look a lot like the XB-982, although the Astro ship's rear is actually a viewport. In 1971's Empire of a Thousand Planets, a member of the villainous group The Enlightened lifts his elaborate helmet to reveal a scarred human face beneath, long before Darth Vader's similar move in Return of the Jedi. Laureline is forced to wear a slave girl bikini outfit in 1972's The Land Without Stars. Eleven years later, Princess Leia wore something similar in Return of the Jedi. And Watto, with his long snout and wings, resembles the recurring spy characters known as the Shingos, who debuted in 1975's Ambassador of the Shadows. But the one image I find most interesting is from Empire of a Thousand Planets, when Valerian is encased in liquid plastic. It's hard not to see the resemblance to Han Solo getting frozen in carbonite from The Empire Strikes Back. The Valerian and Laureline comic had its own set of tropes. Valerian rushing into action like a knucklehead. Laureline using her sex appeal to get info. 
corrupt government institutions, godly and unknowable aliens, time travel, planets with a single characteristic, the characters being separated to solve separate tasks. Let's take a look at the sixth volume, Ambassador of the Shadows, since it was the first volume translated into English, and at least visually seems to be used for the new movie, if not necessarily the plot. You might think that the second volume, Empire of a Thousand Planets, is the basis for the movie, which the studio named Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, but I think they mostly just like the title. Then again, they based this production photo off of this image of the duo from that book, so who knows? Our story begins drifting through the cosmos, accompanied by poetic language, wondering how many alien civilizations rose and fell without meeting one another before ultimately arriving at a massive space station known as Point Central. It's comprised of thousands of alien species who each affix a new area to the ever-growing structure, complete with an environment hospitable to them. That's an example of a trope, but to pick up my trope card, I'm going to have to put one of these two things down. So long, Baguette. Surreal cosmic intros, that's a pretty common way for Valerian and Laureline's stories to begin. Uh, I think it helps set a tone. They're traveling throughout all of time and space, potentially. So it usually starts with some sort of philosophical idea about the vastness of the galaxy. Inside, we see several of the alien races, such as the Marmakas, who are dangerously radioactive, but are known as some of the best psychologists ever or the Pulpisims, who are known for making the best food. Most of the alien species never meet face to face, and no one race controls Point Central. Instead, ambassadors meet in the massive hall of screens to resolve conflict. We meet Valerian and Laureline in their astro ship, escorting Earth's ambassador to Point Central. He hasn't spoken with them face to face the whole trip, but just before arriving, he demands they meet him. Laureline is typically sarcastic, and Valerian is loyal and respectful as always. The ambassador reveals that it's Earth's turn to preside over the alien ambassadors, and he intends to change things by proposing a federation with Earth as the keystone. Valerian reads between the lines that they will become the police of the galaxy, to which the ambassador tries to paint it as a civilizing influence. Societal corruption is a trope throughout all of Valerian and Laureline, and there was always this undercurrent that Galaxity, the capital of humanity, was potentially a bit corrupt. Uh, humans had mastery of time travel, and that gave them a technological edge over other alien races, but that didn't necessarily give them the moral high ground. And there were seeds planted in the first half of the overall Valerian and Laureline run that things were maybe not as great as they at first seemed. And Valerian was kind of deluded almost. You could say that he definitely has a starting point as a character, and ultimately he learns a lot about how the world works and comes out a pretty different person. The Ambassador explains that Valerian and Laureline were selected to be bodyguards, nothing more. Valerian is to accompany the Ambassador everywhere, and Laureline is to protect a valuable alien known as a Grumpy Converter. Aliens played for cartoon joke gags are definitely a trope, a hallmark of Valerian and Laureline. There was always a little bit of time for humor, and the Grumpy Converter is almost the perfect representation of that. Uh, he exists for, for two purposes. One is comic relief. Uh, he's a tiny little creature that gets feisty and gets exhausted when he has to create valuable money or pearls and gems, etc. Because that's what he does. If he eats one thing, he can produce tons of duplicates of it. So that brings up his second purpose, which is sort of a plot convenience. Instead of having Laureline and Valerian carry around huge bags of money everywhere, this guy can sort of create what they need in the moment, because different aliens want different currencies. So it's just sort of a plot contrivance, but a funny one. The trio docks at Earth's section of Point Central, but before the ambassador can even say a full sentence, aliens break through the walls and shoot everyone with a clear gel that immobilizes them. The aliens abduct the ambassador, 
and Valerian and Laureline are the only two able to get their helmets on in time to avoid the gel. Valerian rushes right after them, grabbing onto their shuttle before Laureline can catch up and help. Valerian is a hothead. That's a nice way of putting it. When we first meet him, he's a typical honorable hero. He's brave and muscular and noble. But he also rushes into battle without thinking things through. And honestly, as the series progressed, he started to almost become dopey, I would almost say. Like, I don't know exactly how to describe it. Dopey might be going too far, but he definitely started making more and more boneheaded mistakes in their adventures. Uh, and ultimately, they started to course correct that by the end, and he became a little bit more cynical, maybe, maybe close to an anti-hero by the end. Uh, so he had a really interesting arc, but certainly at this point in time, like about a third of the way through the overall Valerian story, yeah, he's, he's hot-headed. Laureline frees herself from the sticky gel and is greeted by Colonel Diol, a low-level head of protocol. He's sort of a doofus whose only concern is throwing a good reception for the Ambassador, and is completely overwhelmed by the kidnapping, but he's also Laureline's only contact that understands Point Central. He explains that Point Central itself is pretty corrupt and everyone works off of bribes. He has no idea who would have kidnapped the Ambassador. Meanwhile, Laureline helps herself to the banquet that's being neglected. Someone rings Earth's doorbell, we'll call it, and Diol worries it's the aliens back to attack, but Laureline points out they would not ring a doorbell. Instead, she ignores the Colonel's pleas to ignore it and lets in three short aliens. These are known collectively as the Shingus, and they're essentially spies or information traders. They intended to sell info to the Ambassador, but when they see he's missing, they offer to help Laureline for the right price. The Grumpy Converter is put to work generating pearls, and the Shingus provide Laureline with a map of the station, with some info missing because no one has explored the oldest parts of it. And they tell her to talk to the Kamineeks, brutal aliens that are nevertheless allies of Earth. The Colonel reluctantly escorts Laureline through the corridors of Point Central that are maintained by the Zools. The Zools are mute and completely uninterested in other species, but fortunately they breathe oxygen so humans can also travel through the corridors. I don't know if you can call world building a trope, but I think that Valerian and Laureline did it very well, and it's my show, so it's a trope this week. Uh, what I liked about it is that there would be characters that would appear that were essentially there to move the plot forward, but instead of being just one-dimensional, like, you know, just one characteristic, there was usually a bit of interesting context or flavor added to them. Um, for instance, the Zools, um, they, they seem mute and all they do is sort of maintain the, uh, the mechanical corridors and stuff, keep Point Central running, but eventually we learned that their planet was at some point destroyed. Uh, so they have no home, they have no purpose, so they've created their own purpose. It, it's, it's a good idea. I think that a lot of the characters and worlds are a little more fleshed out than you might expect them to be, and they work together very well. That, that comes to pay off in future volumes when they start referring back to past events and pulling in characters that you've already met before and adding another layer to them. Laureline meets the centaur-like Kamineeks, and their leader offers her info for a price. The feisty, grumpy converter is again put to work, and the Kamenique explains that he's heard of another alien race celebrating. These aliens are the Bagulans, and the Kamineeks look down on them because they're mercenaries that aren't true warriors, because the Bagulans are likely to use those cocoon guns instead of fists or swords. He points Laureline to the alien world of the Suffis, where various races frequently go to drink and celebrate. Arriving at the Suffis section, the Colonel refuses to enter the main cantina, but Laureline heads in, and it might look pretty familiar to Star Wars fans. Not necessarily a trope, but certainly an influence, at least in my opinion, for the Star Wars cantina scene. Laureline is greeted by a short robot that escorts her to a holographic pleasure room that mimics Earth. But Laureline sees through the pleasant illusion, and the Suffis transform from humans into their normal forms, amorphous, shape-shifting blobs that usually act as escorts. 
Loreline asks about the Bagulins and pays another hefty price to sneak in and see them. A suffix covers Loreline, masking her as a female Bagulin. Sure enough, these are the aliens that abducted the ambassador, and they're partying hard. A Bagulin shaman tells the group that their captured humans have been given to the Grubos, and the queen has decided to spare their lives. Loreline slips out and pays the suffix for info on who the Grubos are. It turns out that the Grubos are blind and massive aquatic animals. On the way out of the cantina, Loreline finds the Colonel of Protocol has hypocritically entered anyway and is speaking with an escort, but she drags him away and they venture deeper into Point Central. They come across another group of Zools who completely ignore them, but a nearby view screen turns on and the Shingus offer to trade info on the Grubos for more money, which is just left there for the Shingus to pick up later. The Shingus say that they know about the Zools and that they have no interest in the money. The Shingos explain that the aquatic Grubos are a single psychic entity, and they don't communicate with anyone, so they may be complete morons for all they know. What the Shingos do know is that they communicate through the Zur, jellyfish-like aliens that are psychic and communicate with them. The Zur communicate telepathically by touch, but can't live outside of the oceans for more than a few seconds. Loreline and the Colonel take a small submarine through the Green Canal, a river that unites some of the aquatic worlds, and they grab Azur. Loreline puts it on her head and gets a vision of Valerian somewhere inside a massive Grubo ship, but then the Zur dies and pops all over her. She's not happy, but they come across a fisherman who sells them some shellfish and offers to introduce them to the Ganiaf Dreamers, aliens who can project you into someone else's dream and who happen to be some of his best customers. Loreline pays the Ganiaf Dreamers and uses their equipment to wake Valerian up. He uses his equipment to free himself and the Ambassador. The Ambassador reveals that he has Earth warships on the way to Point Central in three hours, but he won't be able to talk to them. Before we can learn any more, the two hear a psychic message, and the ship they're in enters a strange paradise-like world with primitive-looking aliens that call themselves the Shadows and explain they arranged for the various aliens to collaborate and bring them there. Godlike aliens are definitely a hallmark of Valerian comic books. Uh, there were the Enlightened, there's the Hypsis, who basically mimic the Holy Trinity. Uh, they pretend that they're God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, uh, but they're really just powerful godlike aliens, and so are the shadows. It's something that just keeps cropping up. I'm not sure what fascinated uh, Christine and uh, Mezier about this idea, but they seem to love it. The aliens calling themselves the shadows explained that they were the first to build Point Central, and eventually they removed themselves from affairs of the outside world, and they remain hidden. They're aware of the corruption throughout Point Central and the galaxy as a whole, but believe that no one race is exerting control over the rest, so they allow it. But if Earth tries to take control, the Shadows will not allow that, and they will will the coming warships to be wiped out. Loreline then wakes up from seeing things through Valerian's point of view. She guesses the shadows must have been located in the unmapped area towards the center of the station, although it's implied that this isn't where they actually live if they truly live anywhere. Loreline and the Colonel trudge through the broken down area and find their way into the paradise-like world where Valerian and the Ambassador are waiting. The shadows are nowhere to be seen, and the Ambassador announces how it's nearly time for him to announce Earth's plans for peace. They appear to be brainwashed on some level. Valerian manages to act way too cocky, slightly pissing off Loreline. As the Ambassador returns and delivers his speech in the Hall of Monitors, one of the Shingos approaches Loreline and reveals that the previously quiet Zul have actually been quietly taking control of the station over the centuries, and they plan to clean up the corruption. In fact, they then arrest the Shingus, but he doesn't seem too worried about bribing his way free later with information. And then the Ambassador leaves early, distraught to learn that Earth has been expelled from Point Central for a hundred years. The humans get back on the warships to head back to Galaxity.
I would call this a strangely passive resolution to the overall story. I, I love a lot of these comics. I love the world building. I love Laureline striking out on her own in this story to a large extent. I love the artwork. It's very expressive. It can be funny. It's, it's really uh, dynamic and interesting and unique. But the ending, I feel, is very anticlimactic when all of a sudden these godlike aliens say, hey, nobody was really ever in danger, we just manipulated these events to prevent Earth from taking over the galaxy. Uh, it's not like anybody uh, that's a human, certainly not our main protagonists, Valerian and Loreline, they, they never really have any agency, do they? because all of this stuff was just set up to happen, and they, they're sort of along for the ride. So I'm kind of surprised. I, I would say this is not my favorite ending to one of their comics. Uh, up until like the last few pages, I love it. It's a little anticlimactic at the end. But c'est la vie, as they say. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this bit of a primer on Valerian and Laureline, or if you're familiar with the comics, I, I hope you appreciated seeing another point of view on them. Uh, I gave you some of my thoughts on the comics. I'm going to stick with French comics, I think, and next week we're going to look at one of the most influential artists ever to come out of the area, Moebius. Uh, so, uh, I hope you'll stick around for that, and until next week... Keep reading comics. Mm. So French. <laughs>